Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our evening service. Uh, you will recall last week we started going through 1 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, verses 2 through to 16. Very, very difficult passage. Uh, we're going to complete that this evening. Thank you again for joining us. I trust that as we go through this passage and deal with some quite difficult verses, uh, it will become clear to you. Uh, let's pray and ask God to help us before we start. Our Father, we thank you for our time that we can share together. We pray that you would just enable us to understand your word. We pray that you would help us to hear what you are saying to us individually. Lord, as we grapple with some controversial, difficult verses, uh, we ask that you would bring light, understanding, and that you would help us to embrace what your word says. And we ask, Lord, that you would help us to make whatever adjustments are necessary for Jesus' sake. Amen. I'm going to read from uh, verse 2 in chapter 11. I praise you for remembering me in everything and for holding to the teachings just as I pass them on to you. Now I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ and the head of every woman is man and the head of Christ is God. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head uncovered dishonors his head. And every woman who prays with or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. It is just as though her head were shaved. If a woman does not cover her head, she should have her hair cut off. And if it is a disgrace for a woman to have her hair cut or shaved off, she should cover her head. A man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of man. For man did not come from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. For this reason, and because of the angels, the woman ought to have a sign of authority on her head. In the Lord, however, woman is not independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. For as woman came from man, so also man is born of woman. But everything comes from God. Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not the very nature of things teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a disgrace to him? But if a woman has long hair, it is her glory. For long hair is given to her as a covering. If anyone wants to be contentious about this, we have no other practice, nor do the churches of God. Now, we did deal with some of this last week. Uh, we covered verses 2 and 3. I don't want to re-go over those verses. Uh, if you missed out on last week's sermon, can I encourage you? Uh, it is up on YouTube just to access it. All I'm going to say on those verses is we established three things. We established that uh, God, uh, Christ is the head over everything. We then established that man is the head over woman, and we established that God is the head of Christ. And so those three relationships of authority and submission are how Paul sets up the rest of the chapter, and we're going to get to the rest of that. Now, I just wanted to say one thing because I ran out of time last time. When we talk about uh, these principles that come out of verse 3, I think what is important to understand is these principles are not just confined to the church, not just confined to the family, but are confined to the broader aspects of society. Now that is going to be brought out, and so I'm not going to say too much on this, it's going to be brought out a little bit later, because when Paul argues his case, he argues from creation. So it's not the situation in Corinth that Paul is going to argue from a cultural situation, though the cultural situation has some relevance, he is going to state his case by going right back to creation and so trying to establish these fundamental principles that are in play from creation right up until when Christ comes. Now, if we think of this applicationally, um, 
in terms of our society, it means that from a creation point of view, from, a, from God's point of view, what God seems to be saying here is that even in positions that have overt authority, overt leadership within a culture, those positions ought to be occupied by men. So whether it's the Prime Minister of Australia, even our premiers, for example, or positions of, of great authority of a power, God's order in creation is that those positions should, according to creation, be positions that men ought to take on uh, as part of their responsibility before God for the leadership that he has given them. Now, I know that's uncomfortable. I know that in the society we live, we don't like to hear that. And I know that there will be great objection from some uh, points and, and some people will say, no, 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 I, I, I don't agree with that. And I understand that for, for some people, it's a, it's a huge stumbling block uh, even perhaps to becoming Christians. But what we need to understand is that God establishes the principles. Our responsibility is to submit to God, submit to our head, the Lord Jesus Christ, and apply those principles in our lives as uncomfortable as they may or may not be. And we're going to get a little bit later into why it's so important that uh, these principles are applied. So firstly, we looked at the principle of authority established. Secondly, we're going to look at the principle of authority applied. Look at verses 4 to 6. Let me read them. Verses 4 to 6. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. Now, that is in two ways. If I can just pause there quickly. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. What he means by that is he brings a disgrace to himself and he brings a disgrace to God. So the head here is the head as Christ is the head and he's bringing disgrace to Christ, but he's also bringing disgrace to himself. If he prays with his head covered, we'll come back to what it means by covered. And every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head in the same way. So she brings a disgrace upon herself and she dishonors her head. And that is the authority of man. He dishonors, she dishonors that. Just, it is just as though her head were shaved. Um, and so Paul says, if a woman does not cover her head, she should have her hair cut off. And if it is a disgrace for a woman to have her hair cut off or shaved, she should cover her head. In other words, what the Apostle Paul says, if you want to bring disgrace and dishonor by not covering your head, then you may as well go the whole hog and cut your hair off completely. You may as well shave your head if that's your attitude. Now, when he comes to apply this head covering, we need to ask ourselves the question, what kind of head covering is he referring to? Now, it is very obscure, and it's difficult to be absolutely certain about the type of head covering that Paul is referring to. More than likely, it is either something that covered the head, the kind of a veil, or something similar to a shawl that went over the head and then over the shoulders. It's more important to try and understand why Paul talks about head coverings and what the function of those head coverings were and why it's disgraceful for a man to wear a head covering. Now, in the Corinthian cultural situation, it was very important that women went outdoors and when they went outdoors that they wore a head covering. There was, unfortunately, in that society, those who were engaged in prostitution for obvious reasons who did not wear a head covering because 
the person to whom they were wanting to engage in prostitution needed to see how they looked. And so for them, they walked out of society without a head covering. Then there were other women who were seeking to rebel against the God-giving authority that God had established and rebelling against society, wanting to become like men, wanting to dress like men, wanting to do the same things that men did. And, and so as a, a sign of overt rebellion, when they went out, they did not cover their head in public places. And that was a fundamental sign of their rebellion against society. Furthermore, those who were considered as, in inverted commas, loose women who were sexually loose with their ethics would do the same thing, would go purposely and not wear a head covering in that particular society. It was an indication of a feminist a liberation movement way back then. In other words, what we experience today is nothing new. It was happening way back in the Corinthian culture. And moreover, in the Greco-Roman society, it was disgraceful for a man to, man to wear a veil. If he went outside and he covered his head and he put a veil on, what he would be saying is he would be saying, I want to be a woman. And so the sign of femininity in that society was that a woman would go out into the public sphere with her head covered, and the sign of masculinity in that society was that a man would go out with his head uncovered. And so if you violated those two particular principles, what you were saying is you were saying we want to overturn the roles that God has given us. And men were saying we want to act like women, and women would be saying we want to become like men. And so there was a role reversal that was going on. There was a reversal in the God-ordained a, a distinction between the sexes and how those sexes fu fu function. In other words, we, we, when we today grapple with this whole difficult issue of transgenderism, of men wanting to become women and women wanting to become men and uh, going for gender reassignment surgery, this is nothing new. And although the surgery back then may not have existed uh, to be able to go further, what men and women would do is they would act and dress in ways that would be completely contrary to the cultural norms of what a man or what a woman would dress like back then. And Paul is objecting to that. So the issue here is that some of these women now who had been converted were bringing that rebellion into the church, in, in, into the church community by and large. So uh, they, they were rebelling against the, the God-ordained order and now having been converted to Christ, now having been transformed, now having come under the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, there ought to have been a fundamental change in the way in which they were organizing themselves, the way in which they were dressing, the way in which they were expressing their femininity. So instead of uh, bringing it into the church, that transformation should have caused them to stop doing the things that they were doing prior to coming to Christ. But unfortunately, it had crept into the Christian community. So the issue here is not whether or not women should come to church wearing a hat. Uh, that's to get lost in the wrong emphasis that the Apostle Paul in. The underlying issue, the foundational issue, is the distinction between male and female. That distinction, those lines, God is saying through the Apostle Paul as he writes under the inspiration of God's Spirit, those distinctions should never be blurred. They must not be changed. Men must stay men and women must stay women. And whatever the cultural indicators of that are, those cultural indicators need to be put in place and not violated. So let me try and make this really practical. What it means is that a woman should not 
turn up to work dressed in exactly the same way as a man trying to emulate masculinity. It should mean that a man should not turn up at work dressed like a woman with a dress and a bra and high heels with painted nails and lipstick and that kind of stuff because that is to deny his masculinity and that is to promote femininity, something that is consistent with the feminine, uh, femininity of the society in which we live. And Paul is saying that that in God's sight is unacceptable and you bring disgrace not only on yourself but you just bring disgrace on the authority structures which God has ordained which God has brought from the beginning of creation God does not want any confusion to exist between the sexes Men need to be men and women need to be women. And whatever those cultural indicators are that show that, that reveal that, those cultural indicators need to remain in place. So if I can give you another example. I haven't seen the movie. I've just seen pictures from the movie. But the movie G.I. Jane that starred Demi Moore. Demi Moore cut her head, her hair completely off her head so that she... Uh, had a, a, a bald head, that is a sign of masculinity in our society. And that is not something that a woman should be doing in order to try and transform herself into looking like and being like and acting like a man. So in other words, God would be absolutely opposed to any form of, of transgenderism, as uncomfortable as that may make, make us feel. He has created us from the beginning, male and female. And men and women need to retain, their, uh, for women, femininity, and men, their masculinity. Now notice what he says. Every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered. Whoa, just stop there for a minute, Pastor. Haven't you said to us that women should not be preaching in a church, that that function of preaching, and we're going to get more into the gift of prophesying, so I'm not going to go into that in any detail now. We're going to get to the gifts in the next chapter, in chapter uh, 13 and 14, so you're going to have to just wait until we get to chapter 12, 13, and 14, until we get there, and then I'll detail what prophesying is. But certainly there, an element of prophesying is speaking God's word. So didn't you say to us previously in another sermon that women should not be allowed to preach in a church? Now, isn't this saying that a woman can preach in a church? Well, the answer is no, because the church is not what is concerned here. Notice that Paul does not use a qualifier here. Paul is not talking about a situation of when the church are gathered together as the church. He doesn't qualify this by saying when you come together. He does qualify it later on. So, for example, in 1 Corinthians 11, verses 17 and 18, and verse 20 and verse 33, and chapter 14, verse 26, Paul makes it quite clear in those contexts. So when you come together, when you gather together, when you come uh, as a church together, there is no qualifier here. So the situation that Paul is surfacing here is not when the church are gathered together for worship. Rather, it is when the uh, church functions outside of that worship, where women may be praying in a public setting, in a home, where they may be speaking about God in a home or a different public setting. And Paul is saying in those particular settings, the way in which a woman prays, the way in which she prophesies in those settings must still be indicative of the authority of coming into submission to those those whom God has placed in authority over her, and that is, in this context, men. So whether it is Philip's daughters who are prophesying, for example, in Acts chapter 28, 
21 verses 8 and 9, we hear about Philip who has four daughters who all prophesied back then. Now, it certainly doesn't say they were prophesying in church. I can tell you they weren't because God has already given us in 1 Timothy 2.12 and again in 1 Corinthians 14.33 to 35 that that is not the role of women to preach in a church. Their prophesying may have occurred in their home. It may have occurred in other places, but it wasn't occurring in the church. But nevertheless, when they did prophesy, they needed to do a way, do it in a way that demonstrated their submission to the male authority that God had placed in society. So that's all he is saying here. The point that is being made very strongly is that the roles of men and women must remain distinct. The sexes must remain distinct. There must be no blurring of those lines. Men, you need to be men. Women, you need to be women. And those cultural markers which define what a man is and what a woman is must be retained. They must not be swapped out there is nothing worse in God's sight when a man begins to paint his nails like a woman and begins to dress like a woman or a woman begins to dress like a man and tries to act like a man and tries to be a man. And as far as God is concerned, that is not acceptable. Thirdly, I want you to notice the principle of authority reinforced. Verses 7 to 10. A man ought not to cover his head since he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of man. Now, let me just pause there. These are difficult verses for us to understand. What does the Apostle Paul mean? Well, let me just read on because I think he, he, he clarifies that. For man, verse 8, did not come from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. So, the Apostle Paul now grounds his argument in creation. He goes back to the original creation. And he makes the point that man was created first. Male, when I say man in this sense, not man and woman, but man. Men were created first. God first created Adam. Adam was a sign of the glory of God. In what sense? In the sense that Adam was created from dust and was the pinnacle of God's creation. And God's glory is revealed in Adam being created, who is then given authority by God to rule over creation. We see this in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. If I can just read those verses for you. Genesis 1 uh, verse 26 reads as follows. Then God said, Let us make man in our image and our likeness. Let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and the livestock and all the earth and over all the creatures who move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. So God's image is in both, but God's glory is revealed in the fact that Adam is created first. So if I can read a little bit further on. Um, from chapter 2, verse 7. The Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed in his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. So God begins his creation by creating the male first, Adam first. He gives Adam the authority to name all the animals, to rule over the creation. As God looks on his creation and he sees Adam all alone, he then decides he will create a helper for him. Let me again just read those verses to show you the pattern of God's creation here so you don't think I'm making up things. 
If we read on. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east of Eden, and there he put man he had formed. And the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden there was a tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Let me just move on a little bit to verse 18. The Lord God said, It is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. In other words, I will make someone who is like him and who will help him to fulfill the command that God has given him to rule over creation. She is his vice regent. She helps him. She enables him to fulfill the role that God has given him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground uh, all the beasts of the field and all the birds of the air. And he brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called them, each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave all the livestock and the birds and the air and the beasts of the field their name. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and he closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made from the rib he had taken out of the man and he brought her to man. He made woman from the rib. So in other words, God's glory is revealed in creating Adam from, dove, uh, from dust. Man's glory is revealed by God taking a rib out of Adam, this is the first surgery that occurred in the Bible, and closing up of the womb, uh, of the wound that God had caused by taking the rib out. I'm sure Adam had no scar, but God does some, puts him in a deep sleep, puts him in an anesthetic, takes out a rib from him, and from that he creates woman. The method, the way in which God creates woman is different from the way in which he creates man. Now, that is obvious. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to read that and see that. And what we see then clearly here is that God creates woman for man and not man for woman. He makes that quite clear. He said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will create a helper for him. And so Eve is created as the one who comes out of Adam and is the glory of Adam because she is created from a rib in Adam and she is created in order that she may help Adam fulfill the role that God has given him in creation. Now, if I may quote one of the commentators, John MacArthur. The point is that man shows how magnificent a creature God can create from him, himself, while woman shows how magnificent a creature, creature rather, God can make from man. The reverse is not true. Man was not made for woman, or from woman, or for woman. The origin of woman and her reason for being is God's clear statement that man is in authority and she is in submission. There is no natural inferiority. There is no spiritual inferiority. There is no intellectual inferiority. There is no functional inferiority. Simply different roles designed by God so that they function in a different way. The equality between them is foundational. That has been established in the fact that both of them are created in the image of God. In terms of how God wants them to function in his creation, they are given entirely different functions. And it is because of that functioning that woman has taken out of man and becomes the means by which he is able to fulfill the decree of God to him. Now, you have to follow Paul's logic. That is something that is uh, bound up in creation. The fall doesn't change that. What the fall does 
is the four complicates that. It exacerbates, it now brings to the surface a problem that never existed prior to the fall. Prior to the fall, Eve submitted to Adam. She willingly did it. They did it in a love relationship. There was tenderness between them, and it was not a forced submission. When Satan tempts her, and when she takes that fruit from the garden, and when she eats that fruit, she is usurping the role that God has given her. No longer is she submitting to Adam. Now she's rebelling against that God-ordained role. Adam, who is there present with her, is responsible for that because Adam does not prevent her from usurping his role. He meekly submits to her, and he follows her lead, and he takes of that fruit that she she is taken of so that in Romans chapter 5, God holds Adam responsible for that particular act. And he is responsible because he failed to exercise his God-given role of a leader to protect her and not to allow her to be deceived by the tempter. He too is deceived by the tempter because he relinquishes his role. So the issue is not that she is more prone to deception than he is, but rather the issue is that uh, she has usurped her role and he has relinquished his role. And as a result of that, they now suffer the curse of that, which is the battle of the sexes. And that then is transformed when they come back to Christ. And when they come back to Christ, Paul writes to the letter to the Ephesians, and he says, wives, submit to your husbands as Christ submits to the church. She is now transformed. He is transformed. They are able once again to fulfill the roles that God has given them, strengthened by God to fulfill those roles, transformed formed by God to fulfill those roles, and they are able to operate in harmony with each other. It is only because of the distortion that happens at the fall that this continues to be a massive battleground in our society. Were we all living prior to the fall, there would be no battleground. And those who come to Christ by virtue of the fact that God restores his image in them, by virtue of the fact that they are transformed, by virtue of the fact that they are made new creations, once again they are able to function in the way that God has designed them to function. And so this should not be a battleground in the church. It just shouldn't. Unfortunately, it has become a battleground in the church because we have allowed the sinfulness of our uh, self-centeredness to rise to the surface and cause it to become a battleground when it shouldn't be a battleground because we have been transformed and made new in the image of God. The, the roles are established in creation and are not changeable. Now notice too what then the Apostle Paul says about these roles, because he brings the angels. Now, this is a very obscure phrase. It's very difficult to understand. There's no certainty, but he says, verse 10, for this reason, and because of the angels, the woman ought to have a sign of authority on her head. Now, what does he mean by the angels? Well, there's no certainty about that. Probably what he means is that the angels are those who look down at the church, who are, are, are part of God's people, who watch over them and care for them. And if there's one thing angels understand, according to Hebrews chapter 1 and 2, they understand authority and submission. So as the angels oversee how God's church functions, not only on a Sunday morning, but outside of a Sunday morning, as they watch and see how God's people are living out their faith, living out the roles that God has given them, they are pleased when they see those roles being lived out and they affirm those roles. Thirdly, uh, fourthly, rather, I want you to notice the principle of authority clarified. Now, look what he does in verses 11 to 16. The principle of authority clarified. In the Lord, however, woman is not independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. For woman came from man, and so also man is born of woman. But everything comes from God. Now, if I can just pause there for a moment. Don't you love the way that Paul always harmonizes and balances everything out? 
He's established and he's made clear the role of men and women, not only in the church, not only in the family, but in society at large. Now he recognizes that this, this role that God has given him and the authority that role, uh, God has given to men must not be used to abuse women. It's very easy to take a role of authority and allow that authority be to become a means by which you manipulate and you create great damage to the person who is under your authority. We have seen this happen throughout history. We have seen how despotic rulers who have got too much power, too much authority, have caused tremendous damage on their subjects, tremendous damage on society. We have seen throughout history how men have taken the authority that God has given them and abused women in terrible, despicable ways. It has occurred, it still occurs today. We hear of how women are brought into sexual slavery. We see sometimes women in homes who are emotionally battered by their husbands and who are physically battered by them and who are intellectually battered by them. And, and this kind of abuse still happens in our society. And Paul wants to remind these people that, hey, you are interdependent. This is not about trying to determine who's superior and who's inferior. You are both equal after all. Do not men now come from women? Are not men now born from women? Are men not dependent upon women to give birth for them to come into being? And so he wants to stress that there is this independence and there is a vital role for women to play. That role should never be underestimated. It should never be dismissed. It should never be ridiculed and it should never simply be ignored. And so the Apostle Paul is trying to say, listen, you Corinthians, just because you men have the role of being an authority, don't use that as a way of suppressing women. Don't use that as a way of abusing them. Make sure and remember that you are dependent upon each other. You are interdependent. Uh, the river is taken from Adam's side. There's equality there. So make sure you treat your women well. Make sure you don't uh, take advantage of them. Make sure you use your authority wisely. Make sure you don't cause them, to force them to submit to things that are unbiblical, that are wrong from God's point of view. Make sure you love them. Make sure you care for them. Make sure you honor them. Make sure you, you watch over them and you protect them. He is wanting that to stress that independence uh, interdependency upon both of them. The, the, the roles do not negate equality. They are just different in function. And then he goes on. Notice what he then says as he continues to clarify what he means. Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered, does not the very nature of things teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a disgrace to him, but that if a woman has long hair, it is her glory, for long hair is given to her as a covering. What on earth is going on here? Uh, uh, in reading and preparing for this, uh, someone said they felt like calling the sermon the long and the short of it. The reality is here, Paul is now going to argue from nature. He's going to argue that we know certain things that are instinctive to us. That little word that he uses there for uh, um, growing hair long by nature. No, I would sort of go take you to verse 14. Does not the very nature of things. That word for nature is the Greek word phusis. What that little word means and can be translated is either instinct or nature. Instinct or nature. And I think in this particular context that Paul has both in mind. What he means by uh, nature is that f even from a physiological point of view, God has so created men and women differently that the way their hair works is different. Hair basically grows 
or has three stages. The first stage, and I won't use the technical terms, the first stage of hair growth is formation and growth. And that lasts for quite a long time. The second phase of hair, hair uh, is what is called the resting stage, and that lasts for a, a, a couple of weeks. The final stage is the fallout stage. Now, some of you are very familiar with that particular phase. Now, what's interesting in all of this is that when you see the way that testosterone works in a man and estrogen works in a woman, it impacts their gr hair growth on their head in different ways. The byproduct of testosterone is uh, dihydrogen. Dross, dihydrotestosterone, that's the byproduct. That's what causes your hair to fall out, men. That's unfortunately why some, some end up bored. But the way it functions is like this. Men get to the fallout stage much quicker than women. For women, they stay much longer in the establishment, the formation and growth stage. And the reason for that is because of the estrogen. Estrogen causes that stage to last longer and causes that stage to be slower. Testosterone for men causes that stage to be sped up so that we end up getting to the fallout stage quicker, which is why men lose their hair faster than women. It's very rare Unless a woman has some kind of disease, some kind of medical condition, it's very rare ever to see a woman who is completely bored, has lost all her hair naturally. In fact, I don't recall in my lifetime seeing a woman in that situation. I know that there are some women who have got medical conditions and as a result of that have lost their hair or have lost their hair because they're going through chemotherapy. But that's because of a particular treatment. But in the natural course of things, women retain their hair that may get thinner as they get older. But compared to men, men lose their hair much quicker. You see lots of bald men all over. In fact, if you just need to think of our own church and think of the men who come to the church and how many men have lost hair and are going bored either in the front of their heads or in the back of their head. That's the way it works. In other words, even nature teaches you that there is a difference between hair on men and hair on women. Does that now suddenly mean that if you, as a man, have got long hair, you must cut it, and you, if a woman, if you've got short hair, you must grow it? Well, just hang on there. We'll get there eventually. The second way in which this word is translated is by instinct. By instinct, we know this to be true. So when you look at the history of the world, and I encourage you to do this in your own time, you will notice that as a generalization, most men, most men have short hair compared to women. Women's hair generally is longer than men's hair in society. Now, if you want to see evidence of that, just come to church. You will see that most men who have come to church have got shorter hair than most women. And so if you were to go back in history, you will see this to be generally true. So if there are a few exceptions. Some philosophers, the Spartans, men had long hair, and sometimes those who are rebelling might grow long hair. But generally speaking, men have always had shorter hair than what women have had in every society in every time in the world. Now, does that mean that if you're a man watching this and you've got longer hair, that you should immediately go out and get a crew cut? Does that mean all men should come to church looking like they've just gone to the army and had all their hair shaved off? And does that mean now you as a woman who've got short hair should suddenly grow your hair and that's going to take you months, if not years, to grow it longer? No, that's not the point. That's not what the Apostle Paul is saying. What he is saying, however is that hair, when it starts to cause a man to look feminine, then it's a problem. Now, I don't want to say at what length that may or may not happen. That's something you've got to sit down and you've got to wrestle through. 
For a woman, if the hair is cut or styled in such a way that causes her to look like a man, that the hairstyle is similar to that of most men, then that is in poor sight wrong. That needs to be addressed. That's the issue that he's dealing with. In other words, when our hair starts causing us to either give up our femininity or give up our masculinity and cause us to look like the opposite sex, then it is a disgrace in God's sight. This doesn't mean that all you women who have got short hair need to now go and grow your hair or men who have got slightly longer hair need to cut it. What it does mean is that you need to sit down before God and you need to ask yourself the question, what am I communicating by my hair? Is my hair making me look like a woman? Is my hair making me look like a man? Now, I understand that as women age and get older, it's more difficult for them to have long hair. We all understand that, but that's not the issue. The issue is how that hair looks, what it makes them look like. If it's overtly intended to make them look masculine, then it's a problem. If it isn't, don't worry about it. And the same is true for men. So Paul is saying, by instinct, we know this to be true. Just look around you. Just look at society. In the main, men have short hair. Women have longer hair. That is just the way things are. And thus, when he says to this church in Corinth, for them, long hair on a man was a disgrace. It made him look like a woman. Short hair on a woman was a disgrace. And that's why he says, if you're going to pray, uh, just, just cut the whole lot off. If, if, if you're going to do it with short if you want to look like a man, just go the whole hog. Cut, cut the whole lot off. And so what I want you to see here is Paul's clarifying what he means by that and saying, don't allow yourself to transform yourself into going against how God has created you as a male or a female. And there are cultural markers that make those distinctions absolutely clear. Now, I know some of you are going to say, that's just not fair. I don't like hearing that, Pastor. I, I, I don't agree with you. And, and I'm going to ha- have my hair any way I want it to be. And, and I'm going to grow it or not grow it or do whatever I want with my hair. Well, Paul's got a word for you too. Look at verse 16. Look at verse 16. If anyone wants to be contentious about this, we have no other practice, nor do the churches of God. In other words, Paul is saying, This is universally practiced amongst all the churches. You want to be contentious about it? You want to argue about it? You want to moan about it? You want to gripe about it? You want to rebel against it? Well, Paul says, don't be contentious. This is the way it works in all the churches. This is universal. This is not something that you ought to get in a huff about. So therefore, you may need to spend some time working this out in your life. You need to ensure that as a Christian person, even if this isn't you trying to be what you are not, trying to transform yourself into what you are not, we as Christians need to stand firm on the distinction between the two sexes. God has created us male and female. And we need to ensure that we don't buy into the lie of the devil that it's okay to change how God has made you, to try and go through uh, a surgery or to try and dress like the other sex or to try and act like the other sex or to try and take roles on that are, are part of the other sex. God has made it quite clear, you men, you need to be men. You need to stay masculine. You need to take that role of authority God has given you. You need to work that out in your daily life. You need to work it out in your home. You need to ensure, men, that when you are in your home, you are leading your home, that you are providing the spiritual climate for your home, that you are setting the right example in your home, that you are taking on the roles that God has given you of leadership in that role, and you don't just simply 
palm those off or relinquish those. If you're a woman and you're married, you need to submit to your husband. You need to do so willingly. You need to do so gladly. And the only time you don't submit if he asks you to do something that is contrary to the word of God. But if he loves you and he loves you the way that the Lord loves him and the Lord loves you, then he won't ask you to do those things that are contrary to the word of God. You need to submit. You need to embrace your role. You need to follow his lead. And then in a broader sense in society, we need to maintain the distinction between the sexes. We need to let men be men and women be women. And we must not allow ourselves to buy into the lie that would seem to remove any distinction between the sexes, that would seem to blur the lines and would cause us to become something different to what God has created us intrinsically. And so can I encourage you you may need to spend some time in prayer wrestling this one through. You may need to spend some time on your knees repenting. You may need to spend some time asking God to strengthen you, to embrace enthusiastically the role that God has created you to fulfill. And that role is something embedded in the very nature, in the very order of creation. It is to your benefit. Can I say to you, woman, one of the things you need to think about in terms of the way in which you function in society is the raising of your families. Do you realize, woman, you have an incredible role to play in the raising of your sons and daughters if you are able to spend time at home. And I understand not all women are able to be able to uh, be homemakers. I understand that. Some of you need to go out and work, and there's nothing wrong with you going out to work. I understand you, you cannot uh, function unless you go out and work, and you just wouldn't be able to survive in Sydney if, if you were not working. And, and that's fine. You need to go out and work. There's nothing wrong with you doing that. But can I encourage you as much as is possible to plow time into your children. You have wives an incredible, an incredible role to play in the raising of your children. And if you are concerned with toxic max masculinity, then you have this chance in your own sons as you spend time at home, as you begin to instill biblical values in them, to lead them down the right path of what mascul masculinity looks like. And husbands and men, you have the opportunity to show your sons what a true man looks Looks like you have the opportunity to show your daughters what they should expect from a man that if you lead in the right way and you show them what a true man is then that is the kind of man that they will one day aspire to marry so you have an incredible role we have a role to play in broader society that has lost its way and it has confused these roles that I hear so often people saying and men saying I don't know what it means to be male anymore more Christian men, show them what it means to be a male. Live out your ma masculinity. Women, show what it means to be a woman in this society. Show the world the way that God has created us to function, that we might build a healthy society founded on the principles of God, one not torn apart by strife and pain and aggression. Amen. Our Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the way in which you speak to us through your word. We pray that you would help us as your people to embrace these roles that you have given us, not to shrink from the responsibility you have given us, not to give it up, not to be pressured by society, not in any sense to feel as though somehow we have to bow down to the wisdom of this world, to the deception of the devil, but that you would help us to continue to work out our maleness and our femaleness, the way that you have created us in all respects in our lives. For Jesus' sake, amen. God bless you.